take my jacket off for this. Get a little warm in here. Spirit's cooking me. Ruach <laughs> HaKodesh, not too well done, please. <laughs> Are we on? We're good? Sorry, I'm having a fight with my mic stand. He's winning. <clears throat> so here we go again. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Start this sermon. You know, I was pondering about what to talk about on this Shabbat. I've talked about the Red Sea miracle I don't know how many times. Oh, sorry, yeah. I've got some people who are not muted. Click mute all, bang, okay, <laughs> done. Bang. <laughs> we love you, but we just can't listen to you right now. I'm gonna do the sermon, I'll click you guys back on in a second. All of our Zoom people there, God bless you, welcome. People on Facebook that are watching, God bless you, welcome, Shabbat Shalom. Oh, today's Parsha is Bashalach. And my sermon today is entitled, entitled Water World. Just a lot going on with water. I mean, you have the, the water parting in the Red Sea. You have the, uh, they, after they, a couple of days later, they, they, uh, they come to a place and the water is bitter and it cannot be, it's undrinkable. And, you know, Moses has to do something that God leads him to do of putting a piece of wood from a tree into the water and then turn sweet and then you have the manna and then after that comes another water problem <laughs> where you know there's no water and they're complaining again you know did you bring us out here to die and even though i'm not specifically addressing that issue today my mind kept going back to the parting of the sea of reeds the amsuf the red sea it keeps going back pulling me back it's not the center of my sermon today. But yesterday, my son was talking to me about wind. And um, I was telling him that in Hebrew, wind is ruach, which also means breath and also means spirit. It's the same word, three meanings. And here I am teaching him, and all of a sudden I'm teaching myself, because I can't get this image of the, the sea parting. And God parted it with the wind, with the ruach. So it was the spirit, the wind of God, the breath of God, that parts the waters. I say, oh, Moses' staff did it. No, God had already given him the power, but it was the power of God that parted the sea the breath of God, the wind of God. I'm amazed and lifted by these words, by these blessings. I find this one of my most favorite of all portions of Torah. The, God's miracles are without end. You know, Parsha Bashalach is in the book of Exodus. It goes from uh, 13, chapter 13, verse 17, all the way through chapter 17, verse 16. It's quite a pack. And Bashalak is actually a Hebrew word meaning when he let go. It's about in the beginning of the Parsha where, where it says that Pharaoh let them go. You know, he let them go. In, in, and in this Parsha, Pharaoh changes his mind and chases after the Israelite people with his army, trapping them at the Sea of Reeds. And God commands Moses to split the sea, allowing them to pass. And then he closes his sea back upon the Egyptian army. And there are miracles of manna and the bitter water into sweet water. And then there's another problem about water. And Moses strikes a rock and water emerges from it. You know, they believe they found that rock. And it is enormous. Uh, and it's there in the wilderness, in the desert. And it's split right down the center. And it kind of looks, although it's kind of strange shaped, but kind of looks like two tablets because there's a split right down the center. 
It's a, a very interesting site. Anyway, finally, the nation of Amalek uh, attacks and the people of Israel are victorious. So I've given you a picture of what's in the Parsha. I'm only going to be speaking about s some parts of it. But I wanted to start with this, this kind of poem that I found. It says, There once was an oyster whose story I tell, who found that sand had gotten under his shell. Just one little grain, but it gave him such pain, for oysters have feelings, although they're so plain. Now did he berate the working of fate, which had led him to such a deplorable state? Did he curse out the government or call for an election? No, as he lay on the shelf, he said to himself, if I cannot remove it, I will try to improve it. And so the years rolled by, as the years always do, and he became his, his, to his ultimate destiny, stew. And this small grain of sand which had bothered him so was a beautiful pearl, all richly aglow. Now this tale has a moral, for it, uh, for it isn't, uh, and for isn't it grand, what an oyster can do with a morsel of sand. What couldn't we do if we'd only begin with all of the things that get under our skin? The Word of God, the Bible, says that God takes evil and turns it in for good. It says that He will turn our mourning into dancing. He takes things that bother us, that we look at as negative, and He turns them into positive. And as we visit our Parsha this morning, we find that the Israelites don't just have a grain of sand in their sandals. They have acres of sand. They have been three days without fresh water supply. Mm. And when they finally arrive at a source of water that might have filled their needs, it turns out to be so bitter they can't even drink it. The water is as bitter as they see their lives being at that moment. Wow. And as you probably know, life can be very bitter. And a new covenant in, the, in John chapter 16, verse 33, Yeshua tells us, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you're going to have trouble. And the writer of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, he expands and, uh, well, starts in 32 anyway, and he says, and what more can I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they may gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. And they were stoned, and they were sawed in two, and they were put to death by the sword. And they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. And these were all commended for their faith. Not a pretty picture, but somewhat of an amazing one of people with such courage. You know, life can be filled with many difficulties. Some of us face difficulties and challenges daily, others weekly or monthly. It seems like every time we pass one, there's another huge challenge just around the corner. I once read of some of the great people of our world and 
how their how hard their lives have been. In a famous study by Victor and Mildred uh, Gordsell uh, entitled Cradles of Eminence, the home backgrounds of 300 highly successful people were investigated. The 300 subjects had made it to the top. They were men and women of renown whose names everyone would recognize as brilliant in their fields, such as Franklin Rose uh, D. Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Winston Churchill, Albert Schweitzer, Clara Barton, Gandhi, Einstein, and Freud. The intensive investigation into their early home lives yielded some very surprising findings. Three quarters of the children were troubled either by poverty, by a broken home, or by rejecting over-possessive, uh, dominating parents. 74 of 85 writers of fiction or drama and 16 of the 20 poets came from homes where, as children, they saw intense psychological drama played out by their parents. Physical handicaps such as blindness, deafness, and crippled limbs characterize over one quarter of the sample size, 300, right? Dr. Norman Vincent Peale often said, I'm quoting him, the only people who don't have problems are those in the cemeteries. <laughs> and while life is hard, much of its bitterness can come from our own actions and attitudes. Exodus 15, verse 26, Mara was the object lesson for both the Israelites and for us now today. Listen to me, it seems God is saying, and you'll avoid much that is bitter in life. Listen to me. Story is told of a man named Jacob who used to share crop, and he kept about 20 cows to milk. And one day, a salesman stopped by to demonstrate demonstrate a, a new milking machine. And Jacob said that the guy could, the salesman could do it, but that he shouldn't put it on old Bessie at the end of the barn because she was temperamental. And the salesman sized Jacob up as kind of too young to know what he was talking about, and he set about trying Bessie on with the machine. And Jacob watched the salesman as he put his equipment down beside the cow and put each of the suction pieces on the cow's udders and he almost got it done, but then something went really wrong, and Bessie kicked him all the way across the aisle of the barn. Jacob called for his wife to come fix the man up, and then he had to go into the stall and disconnect the machine. Well, the salesman left without so much as an apology or word of thanks. And the salesman had only himself to blame for, for the embarrassment and pain he suffered but he was too proud to own up to it, that it was his own fault. He had been warned. God speaks to us when our lives become unpleasant and the sources of our life's water become bitter. I don't know how often you ever look at the writings of the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah. In chapter 55, the first three verses are incredibly miraculous. The more you read it, the more you get out of it. Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. Here's what it says. Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have, to, uh, and, and you who have uh, no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, he says, like a parent to a child who thinks they know better. I don't know if you 
anyone has ever read any of the writings of Irma Bombeck. But Irma Bombeck once wrote these words, you don't love me. I'll continue with her narrative. She says, how often have your kids laid that one on you? And how many times have you, as a parent, resisted the urge to tell them how much you do love them? Someday, she writes, when my children are old enough to understand the logic that motivates a mother, I'll tell them. I'll tell them I loved you enough to bug you about where you were going, with whom, and what time you would get home. I loved you enough to be silent and to let you discover your hand-picked friend was a creep. I loved you enough to make you return a Milky Way with a bite out of it to a drugstore and confess, I stole this. I loved you enough to stand over you for two hours while you cleaned your room, a job that would have taken me 15 minutes. I loved you enough to not make excuses for your lack of respect or your bad manners. I loved you enough to ignore what every other mother did. I loved you enough to figure you would lie, to figure you would lie about the parties being chaperoned and forgive you for it after discovering that I was right. I loved you enough to let you stumble, fail, and fall so that you could learn to stand alone. I loved you enough to accept you for what you were, not what I wanted you to be. But most of all, I loved you enough to say no, even when you hated me for it. And that was the hardest part of all. You see, when the Israelites were faced with bitter waters, how did God heal the waters? by a piece of a tree. What did the tree signify? We don't dwell on it. We read it, our minds, it's like a little check mark, a little question, but we keep reading on. I don't know when we will discover that the Bible is not a dime store novel. It's not meant to be read like a book. It's meant to be studied sentence by sentence, word by word, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, book by book. Every letter that God has in the Bible is important. The letter, the words, the construction, even the placement is important. A piece of a tree what did the tree signify? Proverbs 11 tells us this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Okay, great. So all I have to do is find a righteous person. Hmm. Romans chapter 3, quoting from the Tanakh, says, There is none, no one righteous. No, not one. So who's righteous? As we examine the whole of the Bible, there is only truly one righteous being ever to walk the earth, and that was Yeshua, the Son of God. He is the Eschayim, the tree of life. You know, the, the wooden poles, if you will, that the Torah is wrapped around and, 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 and put upon, those are called the Eschayim the tree of life, because they hold the word of God. Yeshua is the Yitzchayim, the tree of life. Let me get back to the bitter water made sweet here. In John 4, Yeshua responding to the Samaritan woman at the well, he says this, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Mayim Chaim, living water. And in John chapter 7, verses 37-38, it says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Yeshua stood up and cried out loudly, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It's kind of like, in his words... The Torah is coming in like the ocean closing upon the Egyptians. You have there from, from 
Moses from the from the uh, uh, the Red Sea miracle. You have right in there the uh, the prophecy from Isaiah, the bitter water into sweet, the water from the rock, living water. Even that scripture from Isaiah fifty five. Come to me, listen to me, right there. If anyone is thirty thirsty, let him come to me. Isaiah fifty five and drink. Then he says, who ever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Mayim Chayim. You see, our healing, and I'm not just talking about physical healing, our emotional healing, our mental healing, our spiritual healing, all facets that make us who we are, our healing does not stop with the healing of the waters. That's only a part. Yes. After we've been refreshed, God gives us his spirit, his ruach, his wind, his breath, his spirit to heal the part of us that makes our lives bitter. Amen. When life is so harsh, God's spirit guides us back to him. It is there at our weakest point when we are downtrodden, when we are just kicked so far down, there is no further down to go, God is always there waiting to help us back up. Okay. Let's jump ahead to the next water problem in Exodus 17. Exodus 17 says, All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of Sin uh, in stages according to the command of Adonai and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Hello, here we go again. So the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Adonai? But the people thirsted for water there. And they complained against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? To kill us with thirst along with our children and cattle? And so Moses cried out to Adonai saying, Who am I to do for these people? I'm sorry, what am I to do for these people? They are about ready to stone me. Adonai said to Moses, walk before the people and take the elders of Israel with you, along with your staff with which you struck the river. Take it in your hand and go. Behold, I will stand before you, there upon the rock in Horeb. You are to strike the rock, and water will come out of it so that the people can drink. And then Moses did just so in the eyes of the elders of Israel. The name of the place was called Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the children of Israel and because they tested Adonai saying, is Adonai among us or not? Is God among us or not? A small boy took a phone, and he dialed zero, dialed O. Operator answered. He asked the operator to call a number for him. He didn't speak clearly, so she couldn't understand it. After repeating it four times, he just blurted out, you operators are dumb. He slammed down the phone. Hearing this, his mother was shocked. She called the operator right back and made the boy apologize. Later, when his mother left the house, the boy got on the phone again. Dial zero. They answered. He says, is this the same operator I talked to a little while ago? Yes, she said. Well, said the boy, I still think you're dumb. <laughs> like the telephone operator, many of us have had positions of responsibility or authority that caused us to make decisions that others have not liked. A, business an, a businessman once had a disturbed customer that called him twice, cursed him out, and then abruptly hung up. In our Parsha today, Moses is in a very similar position. The people have quarreled with him. They've grumbled at him. They've misused and abused him. They, and, and Moses is disheartened. He's even wondered if they intend to stone him. Have you ever felt like that? Here at Rephidim, these people are not just thirsty. They're mad. They're angry. They're ready to devour him. They've been six months in the desert at this point with nothing but rocks and sand. I can imagine what transpired. 
They question Moses' leadership. Why did you bring us out of Egypt, they say. They dwell in his faults, which are not too hard to do since everybody has some imperfections. It was a crazy thing. You know, a respected rabbi once commented on the number of words he spoke and wrote each week. The rabbi said, when you turn out that many words each week, you're going to make some slip up now and then. And they questioned his character and his morality. How can you defend against such people? To defend yourself, you first need to know who to talk to about your problem. Very important. Who do you talk to about your problem? Both situations, they grumbled against Moses, and first he turns bitter water into sweet water. The next, they, he, turn, you know, he brings water from a rock. And even before these two, he splits the sea. When they were again accusing him, did you bring us out of Egypt so you we're out of slavery so we can die? Who did the Israelites talk to? They talked to Moses. No. They didn't so much talk to him as they talked at him. They quarreled with Moses. They grumbled behind his back. And that's too, just too often how religious people behave. Do you see anywhere in the text today in our Parsha where the Israelites talk to God about their complaints? Nope. But Moses did. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 17 he talks to God. Moses prayed. Why did he pray? He prayed because he knew how he got to Rephidim. How did he get there? He knew exactly who led him there. So he asked him, who knows? He believed in God's faithfulness, and he believed that God would deliver him from these difficulties. And that's some of the things that we're missing. You've got to believe that God is faithful. You've got to believe that God will deliver you from your difficulty. Amen. Secondly, we must realize that prayer must be followed by a proper attitude. I hear people say all the time, oh, well, you know, we prayed about it. He prayed about it. We prayed about it. I prayed about it. What does that mean? You went, oh God, please take me to you know, Amen. I prayed about it. So what? You may as well go pray to a piece of stone or a rock. Is your heart in the right place? Are you asking that, you know, if, if I have a serious prayer and it's something that I feel I want to be rescued from, delivered from, I want God involvement in something, I try. I'm an imperfect, imperfect human being, but I try to end it with, may it be your will. Yeah. His purposes are far above my understanding. But we've got to believe, and we've got to pray in a way that produces a proper attitude. You can't just wish your problems away in a prayer, but you can approach them with the right mindset. Notice Moses doesn't get angry. He doesn't put these people down. He doesn't start a grumbling campaign of his own. He doesn't question their morality or their parents' heritage. He doesn't respond in any of the ways that are common for people under fire. person gets accused, and what's the they do? They start accusing the other side. Not Moses, not here. And God warns us about this. In James chapter 1, verse 20, in the New Covenant, James 1, verse 20, he says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. What I find instructive, though, here in Genesis, instructive to me, is that sometime later in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 to 32, Moses offers his very life in exchange for theirs. These same people that were ready to stone him, the same people that were grumbling against him, calling him names, names you know, good, dirty, you know, former prince of Egypt, blah, 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 brought us out here, no water, yak, yak. Here, and, and it says, then Moses returned to Adonai and said, alas, these people have sinned greatly and, and made gods of gold. Yet now, please forgive their sin. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Wow. He offered his life for theirs. Sound like someone you know? One of the last things we need to do is we need to obey God. 
We're willing to pray about something. We're willing to be a people of faith, but oftentimes we don't want to listen to what God says. We put that aside. As long as it's what I get, what I want, then yeah, I'll pray. We need to obey God. What was Moses commanded to do? To go to the rock and strike it. And that's exactly what he did. He obeyed God. God said, I will go before you. I will be there at the rock in Horeb. Does Horeb sound familiar? Yeah, that's where the mountain of God was. Horeb. Did you know that it is possible to get water from a rock? It's true. Using a furnace and heating the rock to a certain temperature, geologists have found that you can get about a pint of water from 100 pounds of rock. It's true. Heat releases the hydrogen and oxygen within the rocks, which then bonds them to form H2O. But that's still a hard way to water over a million people. So it didn't happen that way. But sometimes I wonder, why one rock with all those people? God could have made a thousand rocks do this. One rock, one rock. So many people, so many animals. Why did God do it that way? I remember this verse in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. It's from uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4 says this. For I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters. Let me rephrase that. I want you to understand that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and they were immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, manna, and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Messiah. Amen. Right there, right there. Not guessing, not trying to twist something in a way that makes it sound good for your ministry, your purpose. Right there, the rock was Messiah. In essence, you could say Moses created a great miracle because he kept his eyes fixed on the rock and not on the people. And he stepped out ahead of his problems in faith to solve a Moses-sized problem, we need to go ahead beyond the grumblers. In other words, don't let the multitude out there and their opinions get between you and your rock. I'm not talking about prudential insurance, I'm talking about God. We need to fix our eyes on God and not on the grumblers. And they'll always be there. They were there from the days of Noah, they're there today, they've been there since in all periods of time. There'll always be the grumblers and the complainers, the competitors. Someone once wrote, We once rescued a bird from the claws of our cat. And though its wing was broken, the frightened bird struggled to escape my loving hands. Contrast this to a little girl's trip to the doctor. Her strep throat meant a shock was necessary. Frightened, she cried to, out to her father, No, Daddy, no, Daddy, please, no, Daddy. But all the while, she gripped him tightly around the neck. That's what the Spirit of God does for us. It helps us to cling to God rather than to flee away from Him. And there, in that constant miracle of His embrace, lies the greatest of all healings. You see, we face challenges of bitterness and fear time after time. It's how we react to it that makes all the difference in our lives. We can grumble and we can complain and we can condemn like the Israelites did to Moses at Meribah and Rephidim. Or we can be more like Moses and fix our eyes on the rock. Fix our eyes on the tree of life. Because both the tree of life and the rock are symbols of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. I'm going to close with a scripture I hope will bless you and enlighten you and fill you and enrich you and feed you as much as it has me in these last days. Hebrews chapter 3, 
And I offer this passage as counsel to you and to all who hear this message. Hebrews 3, starting in verse 12. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you have an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day by day as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Messiah if we hold our original conviction firm until the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And the rebellion is referring to Meribah and Masa. So I offer that as counsel. Remember, Yeshua is the tree of life. And he is our rock. Shabbat shalom. Amen.